exploration has always been an important part about the Zelda franchise. And that still applies here. The difference, though, lies with the exploration itself. See, in the games before Breath of the Wild, Hyrule was more linear, but still open, and you would get a variety of items that would allow you to get to new areas. But Breath of the Wild would completely change that, by giving you all the tools from the beginning. And that's the biggest difference by far. Experiencing Breath of the Wild for the very first time is something I will never forget. The iconic scene where Link runs up, the Great Plateau, in this Hyrule, is special. There's a simplicity and sense of isolation that I love here. Everything in Hyrule is perfectly made to set its tone, from the music being quiet but good, from the physics, and the art style. Tears of the Kingdom is fantastic, and I will forever love it. But even with everything that it adds and remixes from Breath of the Wild, it doesn't come close in the innovation and wonder that Breath of the Wild has. I think one of the biggest secrets to Breath of the Wild's success was the climbing mechanics. In other open world games, such as Horizon Zero Dawn or Ghost of Tsushima, you can climb either at designated spots or not at all. In games like that, you have to follow the terrain that's designed to be travelled over in order to get anywhere. While you can do objectives in different orders and take different paths to them, the problem remains that you are essentially following one of many set paths. It's going from point A to point B without the ability to actually visit the little places in between. You can only look at things from a set number of viewpoints. There are only so many times you could do this before it gets boring. This is the great pitfall that most open world games fall into. Breath of the Wild, however, has its mechanics designed in such a way to avoid this. You can still go from point A straight to point B, but you can also go to every minute point in between. Almost every vertical surface in the game can be climbed, as long as you go about it in the right way. See that mountain over there? You don't have to follow a preset mountain path to get to the top. You can find your own path. Then of course you also have the stamina upgrades. To find shrines you oftentimes have to climb some more forced. And then of course the shrines reward you with severe orbs that you can trade in for more stamina, which makes you able to climb for longer durations. Through this system, both the world focuses on exploring every crevice of the world. Exploration becomes both the journey and the reward. Furthermore, we also have the Pillaglider, a tool that is incredibly fun to use and intrinsically linked to the aforementioned mechanics. Gliding gives you good horizontal distance and can help you navigate over trickier terrain like rivers and canyons, but in order to be able to use the pure glider to its fullest extent, you must first gain as much vertical height as possible. Thus, a large amount of Breath of Wild's gameplay loop is about trying to figure out how to best use the climbing mechanics to get maximum height and thus prolong your glide distance. To do this, you have to scan the horizon, look at all the different mountains, hills, and steps around you in order to try to find the best place to glide from. In this way, the focus of the game is shifted away from the physics and back to the in-game environments. Any small change in between, no matter how commonplace, could become vital to your gameplay. The game, in a lot of ways, gently encourages you to familiarize yourself with both its physics and its world. In doing so, the game practically ensures itself a place in your mind. If you ever truly get into Breath of the Wild, it's a game that you will always feel at home in, and coming back to it after a long break will always feel natural. Unlike the Hyrule section in my Tears of the Kingdom video, I'll be talking about every region here and my general thought on each one. And so, I'll start with the most iconic one, the Great Plateau. Breath of the Wild's opening hours excel because of the Great Plateau, and for that, I'm thankful. The Great Plateau is a great starting point. It's a great tutorial area. To me, great tutorial areas, or the places where you start out in a game, has to mean something for the story, gameplay, and or tone. Tears of the Kingdom would kind of fail in that regard, with the Great Sky Island. Of course, since there's a lot more to that game mechanic-wise, you need a little less freedom, but it makes the opening hours not as strong as Breath of the Wild at all. A better example of what makes a tutorial area great is Twilight Princess. It's so peaceful, and I love that so much. And to me, a large part about why I love Twilight Princess so much is because of how much it contrasts from the final game. And then there's Breath of the Wild, that excels because of what the Great Plateau represents. Farron's our next region, and while I don't like it as much as Farron Woods and Twilight Princess, it ain't half bad. It's more of a jungle here, and has a very different vibe. One interesting location here is Lurline Village, which is just incredibly cozy, and has a vibe that you never get to see in any other village in Hyrule. But otherwise, it's a pretty decent region. This version of Gerudo Desert is my favorite out of any Zelda game. Here though, I think they made the perfect mix of it feeling like a desolate wasteland and having things to do. There's also the Gerudo Highlands, which are cool, but the coolest thing here is the Yiga Clan Hangout, which I liked a lot more than Divine Beast Vagnabors. Up next is Nekluda, and like usual at this point, it's a cool region. My favorite part about this region is dueling peaks, a mountain split in half, and once again, that's cool as hell. And once we move past that, 
you get to the Dueling Pig Stable, which I have a special history with, believe it or not. In my first playthrough of Breath of the Wild, when I got here, I liked it. Like, a lot. I liked it to the point where I didn't want to leave. I just love the vibe of the horse stables, and it's just awesome. Man, I was weird. Nekluda also has Kakariko Village, my favorite version by far. It has such a cool aura to it, and I think Pai is pretty cool too. There's also Hateno Village, which isn't quite as cool. You do get to meet Pyrrha, but she's not a babe here, so that automatically makes this area mid. Lanero is kinda wet, and dude, do I love it. This is Azora's region. One of my favorite parts in Lanero is the Lanero Promenade, which is interesting, and in general, the ruins around Hyrule help to make this feel like a real world that's been lived in. I've explored Lanero Promenade so many times at this point, and each time that I have, it's felt so cool. Mount Lanero also has one of my favorite side quests too, where you have to free a dragon from Malice. It's pretty cool. Akala is super cool and also really unique. Why? Because of the shield surfing, of course. Like, legit, that's a huge reason why I love it. And then there's Cherrytown, which is quite possibly one of the best side quests ever. Call of Citadel is also fucking awesome and is sick, and gets even better in Age of Calamity. Elden is... I need to talk about why I'm kind of quarreled about this one. While I don't think the atmosphere here isn't quite as good as Twilight Princesses, it still succeeds in making me feel sweaty whenever I touch the game. The main attraction here is Death Mountain, and it's kind of hard to know what I feel about it. A huge part why I like Twilight Princesses Death Mountain is because of how deadly it feels. That and you get to go inside the mountain and go in the mines, which is one of the best dungeons in the series. Uh... Breath of the Wild's version is just kind of mid, especially with the Divine Beast quest. There's a semblance of greatness with Rudania when you enter it, and then it's gone after 5 seconds. Here's the cold region, Hebra. I don't really find it too interesting. The Hebra Mountains are cool, but honestly, the coolest part about Hebra is that there's a minigame dedicated to shield surfing, so that's automatically amazing. Though back to Hebra Mountains, it's cool, especially with the giant hole sticking out of it. Though honestly, I don't have a lot to say about this region. Tabantha is below Hebra, and it's cool, I guess. It's the home of the Rito, and that's all I really have to say. I don't really remember a lot here, other than I thought Rito Village was cool, and so were the side quests. And almost at the top of the map are the woodlands. It feels kind of cramped up here, but whatever. The main attraction here is the Lost Woods. I like how you're supposed to get into the Lost Woods if you having to use torches. The Lost Woods look so good visually, even if it does make the switch chug. A little up north is Typhlo Ruins, which is so fucking cool. For some reason, it's covered in darkness and you have to navigate through here. And even though it's not that big, just being nearly blind makes it feel huge. And here's our final region, and also the biggest, Central Hyrule. This one is interesting since it encompasses most of Hyrule, and of course, Hyrule Castle. Let's go with Hyrule Castle first. It's pretty cool as a final dungeon. I don't think it's nearly as intimidating as something like Twilight and Princess's final dungeon, but Hyrule Castle here actually feels like a real castle, and for that, I think that's cool. There's also a lot of empty space in Central Hyrule, but that makes sense given how the final boss plays out. While the series has never been known for its story, the one time it did, it only sold 3 million units on a console that had sold over 100 million units. The story of Breath of the Wild is a lot different from previous Zelda games. It's on linear this time in both gameplay and story, which I do think is a good idea. It helps to carve out the feeling of adventure that Breath of the Wild is trying to give to the players, and it works. While the quality of the story is lacking in some areas, I do like what they tried to do here, and honestly, I'm a fan of this approach. Tears of the Kingdom would go for a more similar approach, but also put linearity in it. Which, it did help in areas, but it also didn't. At the time, I may have liked the story a lot more, but now it's been a year, and I think Breath of the Wild had a better story. I won't say that Tears of the Kingdom has a bad story at all, I just think it's okay and people overreact to how bad it is. It's mainly the backstory that I like, and that's a big reason why I love Breath of the Wild. The whole game was built around what happened 100 years ago with a great calamity. There's an eerie silence everywhere, and it's conveyed perfectly. It's also just really good and helped my enjoyment of the story. 
the memories are a huge reason why I love Breath of the Wild. Memories serve as a direct look into Hyrule's, or more accurately, Link's past. And when you get all the memories, you get access to the final one. And the one that proved Breath of the Wild had a really good foundation. Unfortunately, I feel like Breath of the Wild's modern day story isn't quite as engaging, but it's still fine, so I can accept it. And for the first time, Link feels a silent protagonist that I can actually see myself as. Since we as a player are just like Link, we're confused and we don't know what the hell's going on. So, the Divine Beasts. I don't even have a joke making fun of them. That's how disappointed I am by them. Divine Beasts are a huge step down in every conceivable way from previous dungeons in the series. While the concept itself is cool as any robotic animal would be, the execution is not it at all. Every Divine Beast feels the same. They have this ugly brown color scheme, occasional blue highlights, and that's it visually. It's a horrible color combination and just feels ugly no matter what. I know Nintendo wanted to make the Divine Beasts look similar because they're all made by the ancient Sheikah, but Jesus Christ. Seeing this ugly brown made me excited to see the color green in Tears of the Kingdom, and that's weird. At least on the gameplay side, the Divine Beasts have a unique gimmick of rotation. Varuta has an interesting one with water and... wait... no, sorry. It's just not interesting at all. And the worst part is, the others don't change a damn thing. Rudani just moves up and down, Noboris has stomach issues, and Meadow moves to the fucking side. What happened here? Dungeons used to be so cool, and the bosses here are just so piss easy. Is there nothing good about these damn dungeons? Infiltrating the Yega clan was the best engine in the entire game. There are no fucking words of how disappointing Calamity Ganon is. Calamity Ganon isn't really that bad, but more so incredibly disappointing. If you look at it design-wise, Calamity Ganon does look weird and gross, so I guess that does get the job done, but that's all I can praise Calamity Ganon for, because the final boss fight itself is just horrible, and maybe it's just on me for having expectations that are too high, but when in Skyward Sword you have an incredible spectacle of a final fight, and when in Twilight Princess you have one of the best final boss fights in history, it's just hard to accept this mediocrity. The first phase is acceptable. You're just fighting against Calamity Ganon. At this point of the game, I was super overpowered, so this phase went by quickly, especially when the Divine Beast just melted away Calamity Ganon's health. I know the devs did this to make freeing the Divine Beast worth it, but this just makes it too quick and too easy. And then we're on to the second phase, which is just nothing, since he just goes invincible sometimes. And then moving on, we're at the third phase and the worst one. The Dark Beast Ganon phase is particularly disappointing to me. There is nothing interesting in this entire fight. You just hit a target on him with a bow of light. I just don't understand why the developers fail at boss fights in Breath of the Wild. They look too fucking similar. And they're just so easy to the point where it's not fun. Boss fights don't have to be hard to be fun, just look at Tears of the Kingdom. I've been a Zelda fan for as long as I can remember. From getting introduced with Link's Awakening, to starting the series with Spear Tracks, to loving The Legend of Zelda with Twilight Princess, and finally, Loving Nintendo with Breath of the Wild. I love Breath of the Wild so much, and I love this series a lot. And even with everything that Breath of the Wild fucks up or gets wrong, I'll defend this game until I die. It's in every way a Zelda game, the same way Link's crossbow training is, the same way Skyward Sword is, or the Tingle games. Breath of the Wild helped make me a proper fan of the series and of the Nintendo Switch. And I can't imagine ever looking back. Both Breath of the Wild and Choose the Kingdom mean so much to me, and I will forever adore them. Even now in 2024, Breath of the Wild, it's not my favorite game of all time, or my favorite in the series. And yet, I still love it. I still adore it. And I still think it's special. It sold this well because of this fucking hunk. Matthew is out of here!